Around the world, the spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to the Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to the Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Langford. We'd like to welcome each of you today to this edition of the Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. Today is Monday, Monday, June the 1st, 2020. Hard to believe at the close of this month, Half of the year will have passed us by. How quickly fleeting time truly is. But we know, in spite of the brevity of life, the shortness of time relative to our lives, Christ is without a doubt in absolute control. He has his hand on the throttle of the world. He has his hand on the throttle of current events. Regretfully, many people are shaken. They're moved by events in the world when our hearts should be fixed. Our minds should be stayed on Jesus Christ. I was thinking the other day of all the perils that the world has gone through since 1900. The gravity, the greatness of the peril, the Spanish flu, where it took out over 100 million people. World War I, then we were followed by the the Great Depression. So many people lost their jobs, staying in in soup lines, bread lines, just trying to obtain some kind of sustenance to sustain their lives. Then the horror of World War II with nuclear bombs, nuclear weapons being used on humanity and the the grotesque brutality of those bombs, what they did to Nagasaki and Hiroshima and the humanity in those cities. And we, we've, we've seen so much since 1900, and yet people today have become for better lack of terms, exercised, nothing but pure, unadulterated doom and gloom. And this generation has seen nothing, nothing to the gravity of what those before us have witnessed. I want to encourage you today to seek the Lord. He is your refuge. He is your covering He is your strength. He's the one that will get you through every crisis, no matter how great the adversity, no matter how great the attack, no matter how great the assault on you as an individual, Christ will surely see you through. I heard a man once say, it's hard to die. No, Living is hard. Dying is easy. I think about Jacob when he gathered up his feet into his bed and gave up the ghost. That was easy. Very placid, very peaceful. But the living part of his life and the unknown concerning Joseph, Simeon, and Benjamin What great perplexing situations that tried their best to overwhelm him. And as we've said so many times, we can read the beginning of Jacob's life. We can read the end of it and everything in between. Our lives are no different. God has a plan. God is sovereign in the affairs of men in every aspect of their lives. We must believe. We must trust the Lord and truly, certainly, never lean to our own understanding, but always acknowledge the Lord that he certainly would direct your paths and order your steps. I want to play a 
an old, old, old hymn today, How Great Thou Art, by a gentleman by the name of Jimmy Fortune. Great, great song. I pray that it'll bless you today and encourage you, inspire you, uplift you, helping you to know we do serve a great big God. How great he is. He truly is a great God. Greater than anything I know of, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 6 says, For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, for thou art great, and thy name is great in might or great in power. My, the name of Jesus, what a powerful, powerful, powerful name. We can have, we can embrace that name if we so desire. We've been teaching for quite some time from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and our subject has been enduring until the end. Enduring until the end. You see, that's the secret. That's what each and every one of us must do here in the time of the end. And in spite of all the sordid debacles, all the disordered debasedness and treachery and things that we are witnessing in the earth, we must remember the words of Christ. He said, the end is not yet. Now, I know there are so-called purported Christians who seemingly are thriving in this environment that we are in on the doom and the gloom. They write, they post articles 24-7 about the doom, about the gloom. You cannot be sustained on a dietary program of nothing but doom and gloom in spite of the horrific devastation, the raising, the demolishing of Jerusalem. And the man of God, Jeremiah, witnessing the unfathomable devastation that besieged Jerusalem, where there was literally nothing left. Everything had been raised, bulldozer, run over, bulldozed, just, just totally run over. And, and the, the sight to behold was absolutely unfathomable. But Jeremiah, in his time of loneliness and without a doubt some measure of depression, despair, discouragement, he said in Lamentations 3 and 21, this I recall to my mind, or my thoughts return to my heart about the things of God, not my mind, my thinking, my reasoning, my ruminating, my perusing. No. He said, I recall or I ponder deeply in my heart. Therefore, I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. In spite of the gravity, the torturing, the torching, burning down of Jerusalem, Jeremiah decreed thy mercies are renewed every day. We're not to the end. The truth is the end is farther out than what most people would want to believe or want, would want to declare. Yet they, they, they have associated, they have inextricably attached themselves to the liberal media. Now, these people claim to be Christians, but they write in harmony. They pontificate in harmony with the world 
news media, the fake news, they write with it side by side. They're in bed with it. Now, they wouldn't see it that way. They wouldn't say it that way. They would say, no, 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 no. I'm just telling you the truth. Men who do not walk in the Holy Ghost, who do not walk in the Spirit of God, seemingly never see anything positive in spite of all the pain, the suffering, the sorrow, the desolation, Israel, Jerusalem becoming nothing but a a byword or a hissing, Jeremiah said, thy mercies are renewed every day. Every day. So we've been here trying to encourage every one of you during this time. I would be remiss I would be derelict if I told you it's going to be nothing but red roses from here on out. The Lord dropped in my spirit two words about six weeks ago. Suddenly, unexpectedly. Suddenly, unexpectedly. I think those are the two prominent words. The word the Lord gave me, Eight years ago, over eight years ago now, 2012, was acceleration. I read an article the other day. uh, Someone alluded to that. But I'm like, I got that word eight years ago, acceleration. And everything has accelerated. But we're not to the end. All of these fear mongers about the vaccines and the mark of the beast and computer chips and all of these things. (laughs) The sad thing is they keep pontificating the Antichrist, the Antichrist. It's not the Antichrist who invokes the mark of the beast. It's the false prophet. It's the second beast. So these buffoons don't even know the Bible, though they think they do, but they don't know the Bible. And furthermore, why they want to teach all this purported Bible prophecy, but they say, I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be gone. I'm not going to have to worry about that. Why would you bother to write about it? Why would you bother to elaborate on it? Oh, excuse me, I forgot. It's about money. You make money off of fates, fake, false Bible prophecy. So many men have made so many declarations in the last two years, and somewhere down the road in the near future, I'll be quoting or playing those statements from these false teachers. See, they're not prophets, number one, but they claim to be teachers. So that's why Peter was adamant in 2 Peter chapter 1, where Peter says there are going to be false teachers among you. He didn't say prophets. He said false teachers. Teachers. Now, Jesus said, Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Matthew 24 11. That is going to be a reality because Jesus said it. And of course, Peter said it this way 2 Peter 2 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. They're teaching falsehood and fallacies. So I want to encourage you to work on your prayer life. Stay in the Word of God, for God's Word is sure. God's Word does not vacillate. God's Word does not oscillate. God's Word does not change. Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord, and I change not. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. The God of the Old Testament is the same God in the New Testament. As I've said many times, the only thing that Jehovah changed was the covenant, but he himself, he never changed in any way, shape, form, or fashion. He is God. He's immutable, meaning he cannot change. He cannot. He can change covenant. He can change the way to redemption and salvation, and he did that 
by the sacrificial offering and death of his son, Jesus Christ. Again, I think about those who are so anti-Semitic today. They're in bed with the Muslims, Islam, those who are nothing but doom and gloom, pain, suffering, sorrow. They're in bed with the liberal news media. They're saying the same things. They, they don't give people hope. They don't give people courage. And they've put out nothing but false statements. Nothing but false statements. You see, when the real peril comes, we will all witness, see, fathom, and understand the difference between what is coming and where we are right now. Last week, we were in verse 16 here of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul said, forbidding us, he's talking about the Jews, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins always, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Now, the great tribulation, it is a parenthetical time when untold pain, sorrow, and suffering is going to explode exponentially. Don't let no one deceive you and tell you we are in great tribulation. Remember, 100 million people died in 1918 and 19, and today we only have seen somewhere less than 2 million people die. Think of that. Over 100 million people died in the Spanish flu, 1918 and 1919. And yet they're saying today, they're trying to equate it as, as, as nearly the same. It's not true. There's a vast difference in 100 million people dying and 2 million people dying. I want to go to Matthew 24 for just a moment because I want you to understand the vast difference of what is taking place. Now, people talk about great tribulation, great tribulation. We're not in great tribulation or the great tribulation, however you want to term it. We're not in that. And the reason we know we're not in that is because we have not witnessed the event that Jesus said would cause that or start that or invoke that. That's not going to happen until Matthew 24 and verse 15 is fulfilled. When that is fulfilled, when that comes to fruition, you will know you have entered into the period known as great tribulation. Matthew 24, 15, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place whosoever readeth, let him understand. Now, that ought to tell you something right there. There are people who don't understand. They, they don't understand. They, they, they're unable to understand. If they understood that, they wouldn't make statements, well, we've entered great tribulation, or thus and thus and thus. I've said it for years. I cannot tell you the year. I don't know the year. But it will begin in the spring of the year. Thus, you add three and one half years to that time, or 42 months, or 1260 days. That'll put you into the fall of the year, September or October. That's 42 months. If great tribulation begins in the spring, you add three years to that, put you back in the spring, add six more months, put you into the fall of the year. Therefore, fulfilling Feast of Tabernacles and the Feast of Trumpets. Actually, it's Trumpets first, Tabernacles second. My point is, I cannot tell you when that year is. No man can tell you when that year is, but I can tell you the time or the season, but I can't mark a year. So this is why he said, let him that readeth 
whosoever readeth, let him understand. Do you understand these things? See, now you, many are being told, well, you're not going to be here. You'll be raptured out. This is not applicable to you. Well, if you want to believe that, go ahead. But the, the, the frightful thing is, when you're here and these things come to pass, there are going to be some preachers, there are going to be some teachers say, well, because the rapture has not taken place yet, that can't be the mark of the beast, so go ahead and take it. See, these false teachers are desensitizing people to what's actually coming. They're being desensitized. All right. Matthew 24, 16, but let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child. And to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Let's, let's emphasize two points here. Has anyone witnessed the abomination of desolation? Well, the answer is unequivocally no. No one has seen that. No one has witnessed that. Secondly, where we are in the world right now in COVID-19, coronavirus, have we ever seen anything like that up to this time? No. The Spanish flu was a hundred times worse. When the great tribulation begins, Jesus said, then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world. To this time, no, nor ever shall be. As I said in the opening of the program today, the people who witnessed the rise of Adolf Hitler, the people who witnessed Dachau, Auschwitz, all these vile, sinister concentration camps, taking bulldozers and, and bulldozing huge pits, graves in the earth, and dumping the bodies in by the, by the hundreds and by the thousands covering them up. Then the cremation, the crematory, burning, burning, gassing so many human beings. That was not the Great Tribulation period, but it was horrific. Thus, Jesus says, what's coming? There's never been anything like it before. Never been anything like it before before. Nothing. Nothing. That's how we know we're not there. And you compare what we're going through right now. I, I hear people hammering, you know, famine, food shortages, and all of these things. Someone went to the store the other day, and they told me the, the meat was packed up to the very top of the freezers and the grocery stores. Yes, the price had gone up, but there was a plethora of food. So somebody is lying to us. Somebody is misleading us. And somehow it's like they want this to happen to somehow validate the truthfulness of their rhetorical jargon. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High... The key word there is dwelleth, not periodically, once in a while. He that dwelleth, stays there, lives there, abides there constantly, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalms 91, verse 1. But think about that. Are you dwelling or occasionally 
visiting. Now, the gospel was first preached to the Jews. Now, I know there are those who don't believe the Bible. If they did, they wouldn't say the things that they say. Acts 2.36 makes it clear who Peter the Apostle was preaching to on the day of Pentecost. He wasn't preaching to the Gentiles. He was preaching to the Jews. How do we know? Acts 2.36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that same Jesus whom you have crucified, God, hath made him both Lord and Christ, Christos, the anointed one. Think of what I'm saying. All the house of Israel. Now, there were no doubt Gentiles there, but Peter knew the Jews rejected the Messiah. Thus, he wanted them to be baptized in Jesus' name, to be identified, to be associated with Christ. But that has nothing to do with salvation. It's just identification. We know that according to Acts chapter 19. Paul says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Now, folks, this has been 25 to 35 years since Pentecost, Paul says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? What does it mean to believe? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. They were saved men, but they had not received the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Yet people will tell you if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you're not saved. Well, you have the Holy Ghost when you confess Christ. You may not be baptized in the Holy Ghost, but you have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in you. Romans chapter 8, verse 9, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ in him, he's not of Christ. If, if you don't have the Spirit of God in you, you cannot be of Christ. That's what makes you of Christ because the Spirit of God dwells in you. All these people that believed were saved. Just because they didn't get the hadn't received the baptism in the Holy Ghost does not mean they were not saved. They were saved. Paul said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Well, they could have been believers for 30 years. I'm concerned of the great deception and misrepresentation of scriptural truth in this hour. Now, we know great tribulation will first begin right there at Jerusalem. And Peter, or excuse me, Paul the Apostle confirms that in Romans chapter 2, verse 9. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. So it's the Jew first, then to the Gentile. Why to the Jew first? Because of the covenant with Abraham. I was reading the other night, I've been reading in the book of Luke some, and I thought about Zacchaeus, the publican, he was rich. He was a Jew. Because the Bible, Jesus called him a son of Abraham. Now we have all these purported anti-Semitic Christians who are constantly bashing, bashing, bashing Jewish people. But I promise you, if you, my friend, were living in the day of Zacchaeus, you would not have liked Zacchaeus. I would not have liked Zacchaeus. Nobody probably liked Zacchaeus. Nobody. Why? The Bible says he was chief among the publicans 
and he was rich. Is that not the theme, the motif of all this anti-Semitism? They control the world. They control the corporations. They control the news media. The Bible says Jesus said he was a chief, high officer, publican, IRS. He was rich. He was rich. Jesus said, Zacchaeus, salvation is coming to your house today. You can find all this in Luke chapter 19, but in Luke chapter 19, verse 9, Jesus said to Zacchaeus, this day is salvation come to this house for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Zacchaeus, who none of us would have liked, would have not appreciated, would have not embraced, would have had contempt, disdain, disrespect for him because he was a chief tax collector and he was rich. But see, Jesus saved him. And because Jesus saved him, he said, I'm going to give half of my goods to the poor and if I've done any man wrongfully in usurping tax collections, I'll restore 400%. Now, that's how you know the man got saved, because God got a hold of his wallet. God got a hold of his pocketbook. Why would he, why would he say, if I've unjustly, unrighteously taken something from somebody, I'll pay back four times what I have taken because he was guilty of beating people out of money just like the IRS is today in America. He said, the half of my goods I will give to the poor and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold or four hundred times. I would dare say the man made a lot of reconciliation with a lot of people because he truly, truly became born again. Now, as I said, the tribulation will start in the Middle East. I believe you'll see it. On all the major networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, this event when the Antichrist stands in the temple. Now, I know there are those who will say, well, that's all symbolic. Jesus said, when you see it. Jesus said, when you see it. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. What does that tell you? Christ says there are going to be those of us who will actually witness this event with their own eyes. Joel gave a prophecy. Scores of years had passed. But on the day of Pentecost, Peter said, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. He saw what Joel prophesied. He witnessed it. He saw it. He fully understood it when it happened and when it took place. And so it will be, so it will be in this hour. We're going to see, we're going to witness this event. I'm not saying me personally. I've concluded, accepted the fact I may die before the revelation of the Antichrist. I'm 65 years of age. I believe I have a great, great, great potential in witnessing that. But I'm not going to say I will see that, but I think that's how close we are to these events. Peter witnessed the words of Joel. We're going to witness, there are going to be those who are going to witness what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15. 
They're going to be those who are going to witness what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Paul's telling us you're going to see this. And then we have the great prophetic utterances in the book of Revelation, especially in Revelation chapter 11. It is in Revelation chapter 11 that we see about the third temple. Now, I know there are those who hate that statement, loathe that statement, and attack that statement. But he gives John a, a rod. And what does he tell him to do? Measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Can I ask you a question? Do you know anything about a literal physical altar like the brazen altar in the Old Testament tabernacle? No. You can make an altar as a Christian in a field, in a bedroom, in a kitchen, in a living room. If that was the term, I could say I agree with you, it's symbolic. But he's telling John to measure the temple, and it's not measuring to build, it's measuring for destruction. See? He says, the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. What's the business of doing all this measuring if there's no such thing as a temple? It's because there is one. And this is the fulfillment of Revelation 13 when the anti excuse me, the false prophet admonishes the people to build a statue, an idol, in the likeness of the first beast or the Antichrist. Then the false prophet is going to give life unto the image or the idol that it should both speak and as many as do not worship it should be killed. You see, all of these things are going to come to fruition whether people believe it or not. You see, this is why God gave us his word so that we can literally witness and know for certainty this is that, just like Peter said, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. We're going to be able to physically, literally see and witness these events. And of course... The Jewish people are going to experience it first. Now, I want to go into verse 17 here of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavoring the more abundantly to see your face, with great desire. Now, now, what does that mean? That, that, that doesn't sound like there's too much to it. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, we physically left you or leaving you, but our heart is still with you, endeavoring the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. What's happening here? At this particular time, and we're going we're gonna to see this time in Acts chapter 17, Paul had to leave the Thessalonians very quickly because of the persecution, because of the chaos, because of the rioting, and because of the tumultuous uproar. Suddenly, Paul had to leave the Thessalonians at Thessalonica. This is why the book of Acts is a history book. If you, if you know anything about the book of Acts, that's why it's called Acts of the Apostles. We are witnessing the mannerism, the behavior, the early formation of church procedure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We see all of this coming to fruition, and the Holy Spirit of God 
is orchestrating, implementing, bringing to fruition God's plan concerning the church, his body. So what you're reading here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17, is what is taking place in Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. I want to read verses 1 through 9. This is what's happening when suddenly Paul has to depart and Paul has to leave the Thessalonians. Being taken from you. They were suddenly removed. Now we're going to see where, why, and when. Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where was a synagogue of the Jews. Synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. So three consecutive Sabbaths, three consecutive Saturdays, Paul reasoned with them out of the Word of God opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Again, the Jews did not ever want to accept that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. However, Paul said, I'm preaching to you, that this Jesus is Christ Christos, the anointed one. Verse 4, Acts 17, verse 4, And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks or Gentiles, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. So there were a lot of women, Paul says chief women, And there was not just a few, there was many of them. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd, disgusting fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. Anytime you are espousing and preaching truth, you're going to be attacked. Look at what's happening right now. Anything that's godly, truthful, transparent, it is assaulted, it is attacked as never before. That's why Jesus said in John 3, 19, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Why do you think they just, without any reason whatsoever, they hate Donald Trump? Why? They hate the truth. They hate what he stands for. These people are demonically influenced, demonically possessed, and demonically controlled. And I don't see how anyone can vote a particular party and say, I'm a Christian. I don't understand it. Abortion, same-sex marriage, sodomy, pedophilia. What a gross misrepresentation of the truth. And you look at all of these Democratic governors who are trying to destroy America. They get their salary right on. Yet people are losing their jobs, losing their income, losing their businesses, losing their homes, and these low-life devils keep getting a weekly paycheck. And you're paying them that paycheck every week. You're paying their golden parachute pension plan. 
because of mismanagement and these liberal democratic states, they want the government to bail out all of their unions, all of their retirees, all of these pension funds. What a grotesque abuse of power and authority. Let me get back to Acts 17, verse 6. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received, Paul, Barnabas, the brethren, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. Now, this is what's happening right now in America. The fake news, the liberal media, and these so-called Christian fear mongers are troubling the people. They're troubling the people. When all of this began, or began, I said to Stephen one day, I said, I, I have no fear, no trepidation, no anxiety. I, I just, there's nothing there. I, I, I just don't have any, any anxiety. I, I, don't know, I don't know how to say it. I just, I, I have peace. I, I, I don't feel anything, uh, even though it's negative, I, I don't feel threatened. I reckon is what I'm trying to say. I, I, I have felt no threat in any capacity other than the fact that the government is trying to take away the liberties of the people. And what the government is indirectly doing, they're invoking civil war, civil unrest. See, this is what we see here in Acts chapter 17. There was civil unrest. And there are those, you see, that trouble. They trouble. Verse 5. These particular Jewish people, which believed not, they don't, they don't embrace Christ as the Messiah. They were moved with envy. Moved with envy. Think of that. And they took unto themselves certain lewd, disgusting fellows of the baser sort low lives, and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason. You see, any time power structure is challenged, they want to squash it out. They want to shut it down. I am terribly, terribly grieved in my spirit that I've not seen or heard preachers crying Wailing, lamenting, pleading for repentance in America since this began. I, 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 I am so grief-stricken. I haven't seen the preacher say, we, mean, we need to repent. We, we, we cannot fathom the mercy and the plenteous mercy and redemption that there is in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We don't see it. We don't recognize it. But it's there. It's there. God has been so gracious to all of us during this time. Some of you have lost your jobs, and I'm praying for divine restoration. We're in the world. We're not of the world. But because we're in the world, we suffer the same consequences as the world does. Hardship, toil, pain, suffering. You see, Paul was taken away from them very quickly, thus unable to remain in their presence. He said he was there in heart, and he greatly desired to behold or see their faces. You see, 
True ministers never forsake, they never abandon their converts. True ministers, true spiritual leaders love and pray for their converts on a regular basis. Let me ask you a question today. Where you send your tithe, where you send your offerings, where you send your love gifts, do you believe those people are weeping and praying a divine covering over your life, over your family, over your business? I hear it all the time. People say, I, I've given to so-and-so all these years and never once got a thank you note. Well, you get one every time from, from us. Every time you give, as little as a, two or th- some people will send two or three stamps, we say thank you. Why? Because we care. See, these people are not true ministers because they have no burden for the people. See, their job is to extract, extrapolate exponentially money out of your life. But do you think they actually try to sit down or kneel down somewhere and pray and call your name in prayer? Now, you see all this show, all this show that they, they, they do that. Most of them, they just send out letters of appeal. Appeal, appeal, appeal. Money, 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 money. That's it. I almost hate to give to ministries because all you hear back from them is, well, send us some more. Send us some more. They don't read your letters. They don't take them to to prayer. It's a business. That's what's scary. If this is a business, and I know Luke 249, I must be about my father's business. The greatest business in the world, winning the lost at any cost. But it frightens me how they've secularized the gospel of Christ and just unashamedly beg, beg, beg. That's why I call them Dogs. Isaiah 56 called them dogs. So send them dog biscuits. Maybe you can get them to roll over or play dead or whatever trick you can teach them for a dog biscuit. But their heart is not in winning the lost. Their heart is building an empire. That, my friend, is God's business. He said, I'll build my church. You see, we are, we are servants. We serve. We serve. We do whatever God invokes, whatever God lays on our heart. But true ministers, true servants of the Lord, they don't forget the people of God. As I've said, I've taken the mailing list and went down the mailing list and called everybody's name in prayer. Why? Because true ministers of the gospel, they love the people of God, and they want to make sure the people of God make it. That's why when I don't hear from people, we will try to make contact. And I'm I'm weary. No, I'm not weary. I'm concerned about doing that because, well, he's only contacting me because he wants money. If that was the case, I'd send you a money letter making a money appeal. I just want to make sure you're holding on. I want to make sure you are enduring. I want to make sure your heart is fixed. When I reach out to you, whether you support or not, I want you to make it into the kingdom of God. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow the voice in the of Lord Jesus Christ. with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.